mercy all oh, mercy flows from this is the one Samuel one one Samuel one Every, everyone know the story of one Samuel one Hannah and Samuel yeah. Yeah. everyone know you all look blank <laughs> Someone briefly told me, who knows what happened with Hannah and her boy Samuel. No one knows, gosh. Okay. We're well, going to find out. And this is a really good story for kids. Um, well, they all, they're actually, they're all good stories for kids. And if you're a big grown up kid, it doesn't really matter. That's fine. Now, to set the background, the days of Samuel just up to when he was born, it was the end of the period of the judges and it had not been going well for Israel. Israel was backslidden. In fact, Israel was very like our nation today. It was pretty well godless. They had a priest called Eli and he was, even though he was faithful to the Lord, his sons were awful. His sons, um, they raped the women they wanted to rape. They, they took the food they wanted to take from the uh, yeah, from the altar. They did lots of bad things that they shouldn't have done, and Eli never corrected them, never once corrected them. Terrible parenting. Kids, when mum and dad correct you, it's for your good. When Jesus corrects us, it's for our good. Right, who's going to be the first reader? Let me see. Let's start with Annabelle. You'll all get a go. You're all going to get a go. Don't worry. So Annabelle's going to read from 1 1 2. Oh, yeah, hold that, please. Oh. One, one to eight, the first eight verses, go. There was a... Captain. Captain. Certain, sorry, certain man. A certain man from Ramath... Ramathane. Ramathane. Um, a Zephite. A Zephite from the hill country of Ephraim. Ephraim well, good, who good. was name, whose name was Ikrah. Elkanah. Elkanah, son of... Jeroham. Good. The son of Elhara was the son of Tohu, the son of Ju. Zuf. Juf. Zuf. And <coughs> Eph. An Ephraimite. Ephraimite. He had two wives. Stop. He had two wives, everyone. Not eight. <laughs> that means was... he was wealthy. In those days, that simply meant you were wealthy. Carry on. One was <coughs> called Hannah, and the other was. Penna had, had children, but Hannah had none. Three years after this, man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to Lord Almighty at Shiloh, Shiloh where Hophni, Hophni and Phineas, Phineas yeah. the two sons of Eli, Eli. Eli. Yeah. Were pirates? They actually they were pirates. Whenever the day came for e Elkanah. Elkanah's sacrifice, he would give portions, portions of the meat to his wife Penina, 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 and told all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave double portion because he loved her. And the Lord had closed her womb. She was infertile, she couldn't have children. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival, her rival kept pro provoking. provoking her in order to invert her. You never do that, you never know, provoke your brothers and sisters to irritate them, do you? Never. <laughs> 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 this went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her revival pro provoked. provokes her till she wept. You wouldn't provoke your brothers and sisters till they weep, would you? No. No. <laughs> and would not. <laughs> Come on. And would not eat. Her husband, Elia, oh, El uh, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten Thank sons? You. Well done. Very good. Give her a clap. So we've got the story. Yeah. 
beginnings of the story. Um, Edward, come forward, please. Just one verse, Edward, you can do it, I'll help you. Just one verse. Verse 11. Come on, you carried all that flag all this morning in front of all those people outside. Yeah. Come on. Come on. One you, you can do it. You can do it. Come on. Come on. Give you a pound. Oh, you don't want to. Mum, I'll give you a pound. Ooh, <laughs> bribery <laughs> and corruption. <laughs> right, so this, what's that word there? Okay. From, by, the, by the 11. Where's the 11 gone? There, that word. And three, nine, four. Yes? Lord, 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 Not just yet, though. Wait a minute. Did anyone get the significance of that, what Hannah's praying? She's praying. She's saying to God, God says, look, I'm, I'm so miserable. I need a son. Give me a son, and I'll give him back to you, and he'll be a Nazarite. No, he'll, he'll never have his hair, or never be cut. How many knew that Samuel was a Nazarite? Can anyone mention another Nazarite? A very well-known, very strong Nazarite. Any kids? Beginning with an S. Simon? No, no. Samuel. No, no, we don't stun Samuel. We do it, Samuel. Delilah was his missus. Samson. Samson. Well done for the young child at the back there. <laughs> so a Nazarite was somebody who they weren't to drink wine or have anything to do with grapes, no raisin cakes or anything like that, and they weren't to have their hair cut. And also the Apostle Paul took a Nazarite vow. We know that because it says that when he completed his vow, he had his head shaved. So some people were Nazarites for life, and some people were Nazarites for the duration of a vow that they made before the temple, before the Lord. And so what Hannah is saying, just give me a son. I'm so desperate for a son. I'll give him back to you, Lord, and he can be a Nazarite all his life and live in the temple. Good. Right. We're getting there. Next reader, 19 to 20, and then 24 to the end. 19 and 20. There, right at the bottom. Early the next morning they arose and worshipped before the Lord and then went back to their home at Ramaha. Rama. Rama. El Kana yes, made good. love to his wife Hannah and the Lord. Stop. It's always good to make love to your wife. It's a good thing to do. <laughs> and the Lord remembered her. So in course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. It's very necessary if you want your wife to be pregnant, by the way. She named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. Jump to 24, everyone. After he was weaned, weaned she took the... Does anyone know what weaned means, kids? Yes. What does it mean? When they stop having the milk and start eating solids. Stop with the breast milk. They wouldn't have had bottled the word formula then. <laughs> she took the boy with her, young as he was, along with a three-year-old bull and ephah e of flour and a skin of wine and brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. Yeah, when the bull had been sacrificed, they brought the boy to Eli and she said to him, Pardon me, my Lord. As surely as you live, I am the woman who stood here beside you, praying to the Lord. 
I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me for what I asked of him. So now I give him the Lord. For this whole life he shall be given over to the Lord, and he worshipped the Lord there. Thank you very much. Yeah, give her a clap. Come on. Come on. It's just done a silly thing. Yes, so. Yeah, good. So now we've got the whole story. So God grants Hannah's request. And she makes her with her husband and she gets pregnant and she her womb is then opened so she can have more children after that. That would have been the deal that she struck with him. Don't think for one minute it was just for one boy that she has to give away. She'd be up for some more kids after that. But she gives her firstborn away. When he's weaned, so he's young, she gives him to Eli, who's already by now an old man, to look after with his disreputable sons. When he's just a boy and he grows up in a temple in the house of the Lord. Well, it's a tabernacle at that point. It's not an actual stone building, it's a tent. And at that point in time, it's at Shiloh. Now, I look these places up. Shiloh is in Ephraim. And Elkanah is an Ephraimite. So you'd think, oh, just next door then, isn't it? But although he was an Ephraimite, he lived in Ramah in Bethlehem, right in the south of Bethlehem. So when, <clears throat> excuse me. So when Hannah gave up Samuel, she wouldn't see him very often. There was quite a trek all the way from Ramah in the south up to Shiloh in the middle of the mid-country of uh, Israel. So this was like a big deal, giving up your kid, you know, like giving up your kid for adoption. And Samuel rose up in the presence of the Lord. And we'll see that he becomes the last judge last judge to judge Israel right at the end of the period of the judges it's a bad time in the history of Israel they are very much like England not following the way of the Lord at all, not even knowing really who their God is and they don't have good priests in Phineas and Hophni they are very bad priests and they get killed later on and uh, the Ark of the Covenant gets stolen but we're not going to read that today jump ahead to chapter 3 well, we've had the kids. Let's. Uh, um, Callum, did you want to read at all? No. no. Fairly emphatic. Okay. <laughs> Let's have. Yeah, we'll go back around, shall we? Okay. Um, Annabelle. The boy Samuel mistreated before. No, no, he ministered. He wasn't mistreated. <coughs> ministered. Ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was where there were not many visions. How many know that that's a bit like our day, isn't it? The word of the Lord. I mean, in a, in a present company, it's not so rare. But, you know, people just don't expect God to speak to them anymore. Carry on. One night, Eli, whose eyes were coming so weak, that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. But Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. So he went to and lie down. Again the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, I'm, Here I am, you called me. My son, Eli, Eli, Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. Thank you. We'll swap over to Crystal. Very good. Clap. Seven. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. A third time the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli realised that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, Go and lie down, and if he calls you, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. 
The Lord came and stood there, calling at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. And the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel, that you make the ears of everyone who hears it about it tingle. At that time I will carry out against Eli everything that I spoke against his family from beginning to end. For I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin that he knew about. His sons uttered blasphemies blasphemies against the God, and he failed to restrain them. Therefore I swore to the house of Eli, the guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned by, for by sacrifice or offering. Thank you. Very good. Thank you to all of those that are there. Very good. So, um, the interesting thing here is that God speaks to Samuel while he is still a boy. We should be expecting God to speak to our kids. Our kids, when they pray, should be expecting God to speak to them. When they lay down in the choir, God should be speaking to our kids. It's, there's nothing that says that God only speaks to adults. Here we have an example of God speaking to the children. I had a real revelation on Wednesday. I was away in Derby, Beersall Manor, actually. And I got into a conversation with a lady at, at dinner, and she stopped going to church and withdrawn her child from church because she said, all they ever do is sit my kid down and they just draw. Well, the service goes on around them. And I said, it's not good enough. I want my child to be incorporated and part of the service, not just sitting in a corner drawing. You know, it's not what I go for. And and, and a light bulb went on in my head and I thought, yeah, the Lord spoke to Samuel, didn't he, when he was still a boy. And Samuel was included in everything that was going on, right at the very heart of worship in Shiloh, at the tabernacle, from being just weaned. And if the church has made a mistake in the last 50 or 100 years, it is that it's just bundled the kids off to Sunday school. And now we are paying the price because so many churches don't have families and they don't have kids. See, the thing is, if you bundle the kids off at a young age, when the testing times come, the times of puberty, the time of rebellion of teenage years, when that comes, suddenly, <laughs> why do I bother going to church? There's nothing there for me. They don't include me, I'm not included. <clears throat> nothing happening. I'm, I'm, I'm out of here. And they're gone. And then you see then the, the generations move up. And the 20 year olds become 30 year olds, and the 30, 40s, and the 40, 50s, and the 50s like me become 60s. And there's nobody in the many, there's no, you know, many, many churches, that's their story. And it should not be like that. And we, we had a thing where the kids used to sing with us. And then that stopped happening because we, lots of people wanted to sing, and one of the microphones broke. Uh, it's been repaired, here it is. So we're going to have the kids singing again. We're going to have the kids involved. We, just like we involved them then, like, like we involved them in the communion. So many churches don't even let kids take communion. Where, just tell me, where in the Bible does it say that kids can't take communion? Just tell me where it is, because I, I can't find it. Our kids are our future. Our young people are our future. We need to make church a place where they want to be and not a place where it's just boring ritual. And that, if that means that we have to become kids ourselves, then so be it. And I, it, the Lord placed it on my heart. He said, I want this church to go to the schools and just make our saints selves available for whatever they want to do. It could be an after-school club. It could be, do they still have assemblies, do you know? Okay, yeah. Occasional assembly or whatever. And just say, hey, well, here we are, we're available. We have kids in our church and we're interested. <laughs> because, you see, the things of God are interesting. The things of God are not boring. Services can get boring, but the things of God are not boring. They're interesting. God is a God who wants to talk to our kids as well as us. <laughs> you know, it's, why do we speak in tongues? Anyone know why we speak in tongues? The Bible does tell us. He who speaks in tongues 
Built. Yeah, edifies himself, builds himself up. And yet tongues is, is like a baby language, isn't it? And so, by, in my simple way of thinking, by being a child, a baby, a young child in God's presence, we build ourselves up. We build ourselves up. By being sort of all adult and... I know what I'm doing, and more. We, you know, we just get proud. <laughs> but we're prepared just to be like kids in God's presence. We build ourselves up, and, and, it's, a, and it, it's the right way to relate to God, because, you know, God's been around a long time and knows a lot. He knows how to make a lot of stuff and do a lot of stuff. And the stuff that he knows, we are nowhere near on that level. So let's just be like kids. Let's just trust him and operate like children do. The message that Samuel received was not an easy message. We read it out, didn't we? The message was, go and tell Eli that I'm utterly fed up with him and I'm going to destroy him and his family. <laughs> so, God doesn't come to the young boy Samuel with a young baby boy sort of a message. Do you get it? Like, we, we're trying to we, we, we're trying to think to the, tell our children, let's tell them all about David and Goliath and do it in such a way that it's dumbed down. Do you know what I mean? And I'm just using David and Goliath as an example. There's loads of other examples. God doesn't dumb anything down for Samuel. He gives him a really tough message to go and give to Eli. And to his shame, Eli does not repent. He just says, oh, well, if that's what God's going to do, let God get on with it. <laughs> Literally what he says, paraphrasing you know, which is so sad, isn't it? But here's the thing, God did not shy away from giving that tough message to a young boy. See, God de deals with his children all on the same level, irrespective of whether they're actually children or they're sort of 60 year olds like me. That's the way that God does. That's the way that he deals. So I just want to pray for, for us making an impact with the young folk in women's sea and being relevant to them. And we'll know if we're relevant to them because if we're irrelevant, that we'll, we'll just get either trouble or they'll just not come. That's how we'll know. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that we are a church with young people in it. We rejoice in that. Lord, it's not easy for our young people to be young people in school today. It's such a wicked, secular world and there's such perversion in the morality of our nation that is being fed, spoon-fed to our children. Lord, help us be a, a difficult voice and yet an attractive voice to the generation that's coming up, Lord. You gave Samuel a difficult message and you're giving us a difficult message and you've been giving our children a difficult message. But we pray that the people in Withensee would see that we operate with integrity and that we have something they don't have. And that is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And I'm standing on a rock, on a rock of ages, standing on a rock, on a rock of ages, standing.